next on Secrets of War. They were the top spy masters in the Third Reich, two rivals who were shrouded in mystery and sworn to secrecy. With thousands of agents at their command, they were entrusted with Germany's most sensitive intelligence operations. In the end, one man would kill for Hitler, the other would betray him. German intelligence is next on Secrets of War. October 1938, Adolf Hitler made his triumphant entrance into Czechoslovakia's Sudetenland, home to over three million German-speaking Czechs. Just days earlier, the world was at the brink of war, and France and Great Britain reluctantly signed on to the Munich Pact, effectively handing over 11,000 square miles of Czech territory to Hitler, simply because he demanded it. For years, the Nazis had crushed all political opposition within Germany. Now, international resistance was silenced as well. But as the world press announced a new peace for Europe, Hitler was already planning a war and had two spymasters at his disposal. One was SS group leader Reinhard Heydrich, head of the Nazi intelligence service, the Sieg der Heimdienst, or SD. The other was Admiral Wilhelm Canaris, commander of the Abwehr the Espionage and Foreign Intelligence Service of the military. Hitler could not have been served by two more different men. Already the head of the Gestapo, Reinhard Heydrich, controlled Germany through intimidation and brute force. As the leader of the SD, he was empowered to spy on political enemies of the Nazi party. In just seven years, Heydrich built the most formidable police state in Europe, and he was one of the most feared men in it. He was just 34 years of age. Wilhelm Canaris was much older. At 51, he was an old hand in military intelligence. Canaris was a veteran of the First World War who served aboard a cruiser and commanded several U-boats before distinguishing himself in a number of daring undercover missions from South America to Spain. Canaris was an exceedingly intelligent man who spoke several languages. During Germany's turbulent interwar years, he pursued a number of right-wing political causes, but remained in the conservative navy. It was a time when everything that he had learned in the monarchy fell apart. He didn't like the Republic. He was looking for a strong, conservative order, which he believed to have found, for the time being, in Hitler. This was his big error. He shared this error with millions of Germans. In 1934, Naval Commander-in-Chief Admiral Raeder needed a new commander for the Abwehr and could find no one more qualified than Canaris for the job. Under his leadership, the Abwehr would grow tenfold immense organization of undercover spies and listening posts all over the world. At that time, uh, he had attributes that were rather rare in Germany. He was a cosmopolitan, uh, he had uh, foreign friends, he went for foreign holidays. Uh, 
he ate foreign food. Uh, in other words, he wasn't a Prussian. He was not a Kraut. Unlike Heydrich, Wilhelm Canaris avoided the limelight. He preferred civilian clothes to his rumpled uniform. He spoke with a slight lisp and was intensely withdrawn. But beneath this low profile, he began to harbor convictions that could cost him his life. When Canaris took over in 1935, it was very soon that he began to differ with the policies of Hitler. He became increasingly bitter and even outspoken in his efforts against this new tyranny. Thus began a peculiar relationship between Germany's top spymasters. While Canaris's politics were changing, he was forced to work with Reinhard Heydrich, a man he'd known once before. In 1923, Canaris was an executive officer on board the training cruiser Berlin when he first met Heydrich. The ambitious cadet was captivated by Canaris's worldly tales of spying and intrigue. They came enger zusammen, weil sie sich besonders mochten, denn they got closer, not because they liked each other very much. They hardly had anything in common, except having been in the Navy together. But Mrs. Canaris played a big role in it. She was, as well as young Heydrich, a violin player. And they held small concerts in their home. And this is how young Heydrich sort of became friends with the Canarises. After leaving Canaris's ship, Heydrich followed his calling and became a signals officer. But his promising career came to a sudden halt in 1931. He was caught seducing a woman while he was engaged to another. Admiral Rader personally interceded and discharged him from the Navy for conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman. Heydrich's world collapsed. He was unemployed. 27 years old when he turned to a uniformed service that would have him, the Nazi SS. Here, men with Aryan features, blonde hair, and blue eyes were considered to be racially superior, and Heydrich reveled in the glow of his new limelight. In 1931, he caught the eye of Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, who asked him to create the SD, an organization to spy on members and enemies of the Nazi party. Within two years, Heydrich's aggressive style brought him to the top of both the SD and the Gestapo. He was an expert fencer, an equestrian, and a skier. He was such a beautiful man, um, a beautiful man in the sense of physically. Uh, you know, he was the apotheosis of the, of the blonde uh, uh, god of uh, the German Reich. Wilhelm Hodel worked under Heydrich as an operative in the SD. After I met him, I had the impression he was an exceedingly intelligent man. Perhaps saying he was a man without any character is saying too much. Nevertheless, he only wanted power. But he always faced a lingering accusation that he was of Jewish descent, which of course bothered him tremendously. And this was something he was never quite able to shake, this question regarding his lineage. Empowered by new laws that allowed anyone to be taken into protective custody, Heydrich imposed a racist tone on SD policy as it sought out political enemies, starting with Jews and gypsies. The Sikkerheitsdienst, the SD, uh, the intelligence service of the Nazi party, these were people by the mid-30s that were really starting to be lawyers, people with a decent education, but people who quite clearly saw that membership of the Nazi party was the way to a fast track towards a good career. As the fortunes of the Nazi party and the military grew more inseparable, an awkward working relationship was forced upon their respective spy services. In the coming war of conquest, Hitler did not want his SD spies and the Gestapo to be left behind. He would soon assign them to the same territory held by Canaris and the Abwehr. Heydrich was back in the military and part of Canaris's life again. But as a Nazi party member, he was closer to Hitler, 
and thus posed a real threat to his former mentor. Admiral Canaris wasn't the only one alarmed at the Nazi control of the military. In August 1938, the chief of the army general staff, General Ludwig Beck, resigned his post, hoping to persuade his fellow officers that Hitler, an ex-corporal, was leading them to war. Canaris chose to resist another way, from within the military. At Abwehr headquarters, he started to lead a double life and surrounded himself with individuals who plotted against Hitler. One man was his chief of staff, Lieutenant Colonel Hans Oster. He was a resistance fighter from the first hour, since the mid-1930s, or 1938 to be more specific. He was involved in the plans of the military conspirators who wanted to overthrow Hitler through a coup d'etat. When Adolf Hitler began to demand Czechoslovakia's Sudetenland, Hans Oster started to conspire with General Beck and others to arrest Hitler and put him on trial for provoking a war. The resistance strategy, and when I say the resistance, I'm talking about Admiral Canaris and his senior officers in the Abwehr. I'm talking about his colleagues in the army headed by General Beck. The resistance strategy was to send emissary after emissary to London to plead with the British at the time of, of the eve of Munich to not give in on Czechoslovakia. Because Czechoslovakia was the situation in which the resistance felt they could rally the army to mutiny against Hitler and take over the government from Hitler and literally have a coup, a putsch at that time. The peaceful triumph of the Munich Pact made a military overthrow impossible. Just six months later, Hitler stunned the world and ordered his forces to occupy the entire country of Czechoslovakia. Czech President Edvard Benisch was in exile in England when German army soldiers took over his country in March 1939. Behind them came Reinhard Heydrich and the SD lists of people to arrest and property to confiscate. SS terror was about to be exported. August 1939. As the German army massed at Poland's border, Hitler asked Reinhard Heydrich and the SD to come up with an excuse to invade the country. Heydrich arranged to have prisoners dressed in Polish army uniforms and transported to a German radio station on the border with Poland. Then the prisoners were shot and the station was blown up. So it looked as if a group of Poles had crossed the border, attacked the radio station, and been killed, repulsed by the Germans. This, which the Germans called Operation Canned Goods, was the excuse for Hitler to then invade Poland and start World War II. According to Hitler, the German army and the SS were fighting for Lebensraum, a greater living space for a greater Germany. By exterminating Poland's upper class and intelligentsia, Heinrich Himmler assumed that the remaining Poles would become a subservient slave race. To carry out this policy, Einsatzkommandos, known as special action groups, were assigned to army control, ostensibly to prevent sabotage and arrest undesirables. Controlled by the SD and Reinhard Heydrich, they openly murdered thousands of Poles in a special zone located behind the main army. It was established especially in order to create, shall we say, a breathing space in which the special action groups could freely maneuver. Soldiers fighting at the front, and I was one of them, never heard of these things which transpired behind our backs. In Poland, Hitler quickly replaced army rule with a Nazi administration, and the country disappeared from the headlines of the world press. Then the Einsatzkommandos turned their full fury on Poland's Jews. It was not long before Canaris learned of the atrocities in Poland. 
When his agents reported on the SD's activities, he went there to see for himself. For him, it was one of the moments for him, it was the moment when he realized that he was part of a system, bankrupt of morals, bankrupt of ethics, a system that knew no limits. Canaris wasn't an especially moral man, but he had his limits, and he didn't want to be part of this system anymore. And he went to Keitel, the chief of staff of the Wehrmacht, and said, can't you do something to stop this, to keep rain in the SS, stop it? Keitel told Canaris to go mind his own business. There wasn't anything he could do about it. So the atrocities continued. Canaris returned to Berlin and conspired with a young Obwehr lawyer, Hans von Doniani. Under Obwehr cover, von Doniani would document SS crimes in Poland and even smuggle Jews out of Berlin. Hans Oster then sent an emissary, Joseph Müller, to discreetly make contact with the Vatican and the Pope. And the proposition they put to Pope Pius XII was, you've seen Poland, you've seen what happened, you've seen what happened to a Catholic country. Now, will you help us, the German resistance, and would you be a go-between between us and the British? At the same time that Oster was attempting to reach the English through the Vatican, the British Secret Intelligence Service was trying to identify Germans who might overthrow Hitler. Through a British passport control office in Holland, Major Henry Stevens was running a spy ring in Germany with his associate, Captain Sigismund Best. By 1939, Best and Stevens had come under the watchful eye of both the Abwehr and the SD and Reinhard Heydrich was eager to know who they were working with in Germany. Without telling Canaris, he sent an agent posing as a military resistance man named Captain Schemel to meet them. Schemel promised Best and Stevens that he would eventually introduce them to a German army general who was plotting a coup against Hitler. Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain was following the negotiations closely and approved another meeting between his agents and Captain Schemel. The object was clearly to overthrow Hitler. Whether the object was also to kill him is another matter. Chamberlain had always said no to an assassination of Hitler on the grounds that the British don't assassinate anybody. Then suddenly, on the 8th of November, 1939, a bomb exploded in the Burgerbrau Keller in Munich, just minutes after Hitler had left the building. That evening, a German carpenter, George Elser, was attempting to flee through the Swiss border when authorities found photos and drawings of the bomb site his possession. Well, the perpetrator of this was interrogated, meaning he was tortured, and would not admit that he had any accomplices. The high-ranking Nazi officials, of course, never believed him. No, a large, a huge conspiracy had to be behind all this. And so they immediately came to the conclusion that, ah, the British Secret Service must have done it. Captain Schemel was then ordered to snatch Best and Stevens the next morning at the Café Bacchus in the Dutch border town at Venlo. The café is literally on the border with Germany. When the British agents arrived with a Dutch intelligence officer at their appointed hour, SD operatives pulled up in the car with machine guns firing. They fatally wounded the Dutch officer, grabbed Best and Stevens, and raced back across the border. Captain Schemel was in fact Major Walter Schellenberg, a young and ambitious SD operative. In Berlin, he oversaw the interrogation of Best and Stevens. The Gestapo interrogator, Herbert Koppler, was interviewed in 1969 by Austrian author Gunter Peiss. Then he told me both of them have been, to his opinion and to his experience with them, the greatest traitors he could think of. Be because they gave them all sorts of information uh, uh, without being asked for, you know. There are documents that were produced prior to the would-be invasion of Great Britain in which the Germans produce an arrest list of all the leading members of British society that would be captured. Now this book is called the Black Book and amongst these is a breakdown of British intelligence. 
this is pretty full of information that is specified as coming from Best and Stevens. Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels lost no time putting the Munich bombing and the Venlo incident together. Soon, Elser, Best, and Stevens were pictured together in newspapers throughout the world. The fact that this wasn't the case was neither here nor there. What it was, it, it made marvelous uh, propaganda fodder for Goebbels, who could represent this dastardly attack on their beloved Führer uh, by a pawn of the nefarious British Secret Service. Best and Stevens were eventually sent here to the Sachsenhausen concentration camp outside Berlin. And they spent the rest of the war, three years of it, in solitary confinement. They were due to be executed on several occasions, but they were never formally charged with an attempt to murder Hitler. The Venlo incident was another embarrassment to the Chamberlain government. Most of Britain's agents in Germany were exposed, many were killed. Now overtures from anyone claiming to represent the German resistance, even emigres from Wilhelm Canaris or the Pope, would be met with much skepticism in the West. Hans Oster was one such man. As the chief of staff of the Abwehr, he was planning support operations for Hitler's attacks in the West. So then he had access to all of the files, and therefore insight into the operative directives which the Wehrmacht leadership had planned. And then he betrayed them. In 1939, he was, among other things, involved in providing the Western powers with the planned German attack dates on the Western Front via the Dutch military attaché in Berlin. The Dutch now had Hitler's attack plans against Holland, Belgium, and France, but they were skeptical. They'd suffered the only fatality at Venlo and were not going to be tricked again. Hans Oster's information was disregarded. In the morning of May 10th, 1940, the German attack began. Their military plan achieved complete surprise. Within six weeks, Holland, Belgium, and France were under German control, British troops were left reeling on the shores of Dunkirk. As the Luftwaffe prepared for the Battle of Britain, Major General Alfred Jorg presented Adolf Hitler with a daring scheme to bring the British Empire to its knees. Codenamed Operation Felix, the plan called for the Wehrmacht to attack and seize Gibraltar, a vital British naval base on the southern tip of Spain. It was a tempting target. Hitler would soon occupy parts of Northwest Africa. If he conquered Gibraltar, he would have operating bases on both sides of the narrow straits where the Mediterranean meets the Atlantic Ocean. With free hand in the region for the German Navy, England would lose her vital shipping routes for food and oil from the Mideast. It would have been psychologically damaging to the British, and it would have been terribly damaging in terms of losing the Mediterranean as a takeoff point for hitting the soft underbelly of Europe, as Churchill used to call parts of Italy and Greece, which he had visions of invading. Hitler signed on to Jodl's plan, but there was one hitch. His army would need free transit through Spain to attack Gibraltar. Then Jodl made a crucial blunder. He sent Admiral Canaris to meet with the Spanish dictator Francisco Franco. Canaris was a friend of Franco, having recently arranged much of the military assistance for his victorious nationalists during the Spanish Civil War. In his secret meeting with Canaris, Franco worried that Hitler would invade Spain if he refused to help. Canaris said, don't worry about that. Hitler cannot come into Spain at this point because the German troops, every last one of them, are going to be required for an invasion of Russia, in which Canaris thereby divulged Hitler's greatest secret. He was about to go into Russia. Hitler traveled across Europe to personally meet with Franco on the French-Spanish border in October 1940. He pleaded with the Spanish dictator for nine hours, but to no avail. He couldn't imagine that Franco would say, I don't want your troops in my country. And uh, Hitler was later said, 
and this was the worst pain he had felt since the dentist pulled four of his teeth out. Canaris then wrote a pessimistic report that discouraged Operation Phoenix, as well as an invasion of Spain. Et Canaris est tellement intelligent et il rentre à Berlin. Canaris is so clever. And he comes back to Berlin and says to Hitler, I advise you to give up the idea of going on Gibraltar, because Spain will be against you. Maybe not in a war, but look at the Spanish. Have they any food to eat? By whom are they given their oil? The Americans and the English. If you go to Spain, Spain dies. Then you have to feed it. You cannot even feed the countries you occupy. So Hitler gave up on Gibraltar. In spite of his most serious diplomatic setback, Hitler was still certain England could be defeated. That summer he ordered Canaris to launch Operation Lena, an all-out spy invasion of Great Britain. Within weeks, undercover Abwehr agents were arriving in England. Soon they were transmitting back to Hamburg the locations of English anti-aircraft guns, troops, and airfields. The Abwehr was ecstatic over the flow of information and passed it on to the German high command. They didn't know that they'd fallen victim to one of the greatest deceptions of the war. Most of the German spies sent to the United Kingdom were captured very, very quickly. There was no resistance network or no friendly sources there to assist these, these agents coming in. The captured spies were often introduced to Major John Masterman. What Masterman did was to say to these fellows, look here, we're going to hang you in the morning, but if you come and work for us, we'll try and send the uh, hangman home, so to speak. Masterman exploited the Germans in a top secret group aptly named the Double Cross Committee. The Abwehr agents' radio receivers were monitored carefully. Questions from Hamburg often hinted at potential bombing targets or revealed issues of concern to the Abwehr. The agents' replies were carefully coordinated to give them credibility. There's another committee that's even more secret that's deciding what secrets they can give the agents so that the agents can be sending fairly good material to the Germans. And the RAF gives them some material, the Navy gives them some material, the Army gives them some material. With all of their agents tied up, the Abwehr failed to discover one of Britain's greatest secrets. Codebreakers in Bletchley Park were beginning to read the Abwehr's message traffic. We read the Abwehr ciphers. They had a hand cipher, which we broke in December 1940. And then they had their own enigma, which we didn't break till December 41. We read a good deal of the communication between the uh, Secret Service controllers in Germany and their outstations. So they had constant feedback on their assessment of the effectiveness of the operations in England. And it was this constant feedback that enabled them to successfully carry this out. The double X or 20 committee was spectacularly successful. Even after losing the Battle of Britain, the Germans kept sending secret agents. In the United States, the Abwehr was no more successful. They pinned too much hope on William Siebold, a new undercover agent. William Siebold was a German-born American. And in 1939, while visiting in Germany, he was recruited by the Abwehr. When he returned to the United States, he reported the recruitment to the FBI and set up a false operation. The FBI paid Siebold $50 a week and set him up in a New York City office on 42nd Street. The dark walls in the office were painted white to help hidden cameras film these images. For 16 months, of their agents and informants came by with war plans, weapon designs, and other information. William Siebold collected enough evidence for the FBI to arrest 33 spies. He also radioed more deceptive information back to Germany. There were certainly people, especially within the military Abwehr, 
who because of their hostile attitude towards National Socialism, very intentionally passed on these false reports as accurate ones. These were the things that first the Abwehr and later Admiral Canaris were accused of doing. Gradually, a canker had settled in on the German intelligence service. They realized that Germany would not win this war. And so, you know, suspect intelligence coming to them from their agents in Britain were allowed to leak through to the Fuhrer's desk. And once you start that game, uh, then the, the canker becomes very serious indeed. The poor performance of Canaris's Abwehr served only to enhance his rival's reputation. By 1942, Reinhard Heydrich had personally assumed responsibility for the systematic extermination of Europe's Jewish population. And he was seen by many as a future leader of the Third Reich. In addition to commanding the SD, Heydrich was named Deputy Reich Protector over the former territory of Czechoslovakia. But his attitude toward the Czechs was uncharacteristic. Instead of brutal repression, Heydrich waved a carrot in front of them. When the Czechs were industrious, they received extra rations and fair treatment. Their apparent support for an Axis victory alarmed the West, and Heydrich became a top concern. Intelligence reports indicated he would soon move to France, where the Allies were planning to invade. The English were also aware that Heydrich now posed one of the greatest threats to Canaris and the Abwehr, thereby jeopardizing their successful double-cross operation. Perhaps most concerned of all was the exiled Czech president, Edward Benish. And I think that Benish clearly felt that if he didn't do something and Czechoslovakia was not perceived to be a member of the Allied community, then there was always the risk that Czechoslovakia would not have the borders reinstated at the end of the war. Benish called for an assassination of Heydrich and the British Special Operations Executive, the SOE, agreed to support him, training Czech undercover agents. They were given very, very precise training by SOE. They were given a particular type of bomb that was devised for them. After months of intensive preparation, Czech agents Joseph Gabczyk and Jan Kubisch parachuted with a support team into Czechoslovakia on a December night in 1941. They began to spy on Heydrich, who lived with his family outside Prague. Heydrich was so confident that he would drive from his palace to his office every day by the same route, in the same car, with just a chauffeur. He declined Hitler's request that he have a bodyguard. Leaving his villa for his office, he took a road, the Prague-Dresden Road, and a key feature in the road was a very sharp, almost U-turn, in which his Mercedes was forced to slow down. A nearby tram stop offered a perfect opportunity for the assassins to lie in wait. After six months of hiding, Gabchik and Kubis finally set up at this corner on the 27th of May, 1942. Gabchik hid his Sten gun under his raincoat. Kubis's bombs, fused and ready, were concealed in his suitcase. Then the sound of Heydrich's Mercedes was heard. At that moment, a loaded tram appeared across the road from Gabchik and Kubis. As Heydrich's car slowed down at the turn, Gabchik dropped his raincoat, raised his gun at point-blank range, and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. The gun jammed. Gabchik was left standing helplessly as the Mercedes swept by. Heydrich then made a fatal move. He yelled at his driver to stop and triumphantly stood up to draw his pistol. Kubis then realized what had happened. He stepped from cover and threw his bomb. At that moment, Heydrich's fate was sealed. The impact bomb exploded in the gutter near the right back wheel. Kubis staggered back, hit by pieces of the car's bodywork. Heydrich jumped from the car and fired two shots at Kubis before slumping down, wounded against a railing. Kubis ran for his bicycle, throwing away his briefcase, which contained a second bomb. 
He fired into the air to frighten away the tram passengers and escaped downhill into the city. Gapchik threw down his useless Sten gun and pulled out a pistol. Unable to reach his bicycle, he was chased by Heydrich's driver. He ran into a nearby butcher shop, but finding no rear exit, turned back into the street where he encountered the driver. Gabchik shot the German, firing twice, just as he'd been trained by the SOE. Heydrich was taken to this nearby hospital. At first, he seemed likely to survive his wounds, but within a few days, he developed blood poisoning. Fragments of horsehair fillings from the car's upholstery had entered his spleen. That set off an infection, despite the fact that they had him at the hospital immediately, and he received literally the best medical attention that could possibly be had. He eventually died due to the infection. On the 4th of June, 1942, the blonde beast took his last breath. A death mask was immediately commissioned and later used on Nazi postage stamps. Wilhelm Canaris knew that his rival's death spared his double life. At Heydrich's elaborate state funeral in Berlin, Canaris played his part. You have to remember that Heydrich had very few friends. Even in his closest circles, he was a hated man. Nobody mourned the death of Heydrich. But this did not stop Canaris from saying to his widow, I have lost an honest friend. The evidence left by Gabchik and Kubis appeared in newsreels time and time again. The search for the assassins became the largest manhunt in Nazi history, and 10 million crowns were offered as a reward for their capture. Gabchik and Kubis were eventually found hiding in a nearby church and died with their support team in a shootout with German soldiers. The SD and Gestapo determined that the operation had been planned in England. The Sten gun was a favorite weapon of the SOE. The bomb was similar to anti-tank grenades used by the British in North Africa. Hitler vowed to make an example out of anyone harboring spies in Czechoslovakia. In the town of Lidice, every man, woman, and child was arrested. 116 men were lined up in front of a wall of mattresses and shot. The women and children were taken away to concentration camps, and German news crews were brought in to record these images. When the bombing was over, every brick was removed, and the Dietze was taken off German maps. As the SS moved throughout Europe, they took anything of value that could finance their own operations. Gold, jewelry, paintings, and entire factories were seized for the fatherland. Yet in one of their most secret operations, the SS made their own money. An SD agent, Alfred Naujax, came up with a scheme to ruin the British economy. The plan called for millions of forged pound notes to be dropped on England and neutral countries. When the plan was approved by Hitler in 1942, now Yox and his men began to seek out counterfeiters. It suddenly occurred to them that they had as prisoners of the German government master Jewish forgers. So they actively went through the backgrounds of these individuals and came up with the forgers, the photography experts, the experts in numbering, the experts in logistics, and they recruited from these prisoners an entire team. The lure was simple. The SD officers promised them better living conditions, better food, and more recreation time. Most importantly, they promised them their lives if they created a flawless forgery. The prisoners were transferred to the Sachsenhausen concentration camp and went to work next to the cell where British agents Best and Stevens were being held. When they produced their first forgeries, SD agent Wilhelm Hodel was asked to vouch for their authenticity. That's when I personally found out through one of my men who went bold-faced into a leading Swiss bank and showed them the notes. 
saying he had heard that fake banknotes had been circulating and he wanted to have them examined. And the clerk said, I can only congratulate you if you have many more of these notes. They are guaranteed to be genuine. Here was now a source of hard British currency that they could use with their agents. They could use it for bribes. They bought weapons in Yugoslavia. When they rescued Mussolini from his captors, the operation was paid for using forged British banknotes. More than 100 million pound notes were eventually printed, but they were never dropped on England. When the Allies closed in on Germany, the forging operation was rushed to Austria, where the counterfeiters were eventually freed. As the German military situation deteriorated on both fronts, so did support for its intelligence service. The Allies had already successfully invaded North Africa and Italy. By 1943, Admiral Canaris was under fire for vastly underestimating the strength of the Russian army and their seemingly miraculous ability to produce more arms and munitions. As the Germans were beating a retreat from Stalingrad, Canaris was in a no-win situation. When it was clear that the German armies would not be successful, Canaris presented an assessment to Hitler that was considered pessimistic. He was immediately challenged, how dare he present such information to Hitler, and where were his loyalties? Canaris was traditionally limited by the fact that he was interested in providing assessments based on accurate intelligence. However, the SD was only producing politically acceptable assessments that Hitler would accept. It was clear that both services could not coexist. In February 1944, Canaris was fired. The Abwehr was officially abolished by Hitler, and most of its organization was incorporated into the SD, now under the command of Walter Schellenberg. The timing could not have been worse for the Germans. Loyal operatives in the Abwehr endeavored to learn the greatest secret of 1944, perhaps the greatest secret of the war the time and place of the Allied invasion of Europe. But on the 6th of June, the Allies achieved complete surprise. That summer, the retired General Beck continued to coordinate military resistance at the highest levels. He was joined by Klaus von Stauffenberg, an army staff officer who saw firsthand the ruthlessness of the SS killing teams in Russia. On the 20th of July, 1944, Stauffenberg brought a timed briefcase bomb into a meeting with Hitler and left just minutes before it exploded. Believing his explosive had killed the Fuhrer, Stauffenberg flew to Berlin. In the military headquarters building, he joined General Beck in directing a major military coup. But his word spread that Hitler was still alive. Support for the coup vanished. In the afternoon and evening of July 20th, 1944, telegrams were sent out from here, the center of the attempted overthrow in Berlin, to the district defense commands containing the names of the civilian and military contact people who would support the overthrow. During the night before the 21st of July, as the coup d'etat failed, these telegrams arriving in the Bentler block as well as at other receiving stations fell into the hands of the Gestapo, who were then quickly able to determine who was involved in the conspiracy. General Beck and Klaus von Stauffenberg were arrested and executed on the spot. Admiral Canaris, a top suspect of the SD, was arrested by Walter Schellenberg. More than 7,000 other men were rounded up. Hitler ordered any conspirators to be hanged like cattle. Following the July 20th, 1944 assassination attempt on Hitler, the Gestapo went to great lengths to ascertain the origin of the explosive that was used. It was shown that the time delay fuses were of British origin and had been requisitioned from inside the Abwehr by members participating in the plot. Wilhelm Canaris was sent to the Flossenburg concentration camp in Bavaria. 
Under interrogation, he made a fatal blunder, admitting he had kept diaries throughout the war. But the officer he'd ordered to destroy them had committed suicide before complying. In these military intelligence barracks, the admiral's diaries were found in a safe. There was a copy of Canaris' diaries floating around. They did get to Hitler's desk. Hitler was stunned that his intelligence master could not only be uh, inept, uh, but also uh, treasonable to the extent that he was. The treasons went back right through to Czechoslovakia and Austria. The diaries served to confirm to Hitler what he'd long suspected, that he'd been the victim of a military conspiracy to rob him of complete victory. He immediately ordered a trial where Canaris and Oster were sentenced to death. Ein Dänischer Offizier war der Nachbar von Canaris. A Danish officer was in the cell next to Canaris and witnessed Canaris being led away by guards in the early morning hours. Before this geschah, heard er. And before this happened, he suddenly heard Canaris tapping on his cell wall. And he wrote down this Morse code. I was no traitor. I did my duty as a German. Canaris' last words. At daybreak on the 9th of April, 1945, Wilhelm Canaris was stripped naked and led from his cell into a nearby courtyard. SS guards then placed a noose of piano wire around his neck and hanged him slowly for 30 minutes. According to SD orders, Canaris was to disappear without a trace. His body was cremated and the ashes were thrown to the wind. His resistance friends, Hans Oster and Hans von Doniani, were also executed the same morning. Just 100 miles away, tanks from General Patton's Third Army advanced on the camp. First of all, Canaris had a short talk with von Ribbentrop, particularly as regards the Polish region. Until the Nuremberg trials, few people had ever heard of Admiral Canaris. On the stand, General Jodl testified that Canaris had served the enemy for years. While historians disagree on his motives, there's little doubt that Canaris and General Beck contacted the West repeatedly particularly an American OSS agent in Bern, Alan Dulles. If you read the telegrams that Dulles exchanged with Roosevelt, you will repeatedly see that Dulles was told, no, it won't work. These people are unreliable. We cannot trust them. The German resistance was the only anti-Nazi movement in Europe that did not receive active support from the Western powers. Could the Allies have shortened the war by responding to overtures from the Abwehr? British intelligence was very, very fearful in their contacts with the German resistance as a whole, but German intelligence in, in particular, that they were going to be confronted with another Venlo incident. At the Nuremberg war crime trials, Walter Schellenberg, the man who kidnapped the British agents at Venlo, was acquitted of all but two charges, being a member of the SS and the SD, which the International Tribunal declared to be criminal organizations. He was sentenced to six years in prison. After his release, his memoirs were published in which he claimed responsibility for keeping Best and Stevens alive. He died of liver disease a year later. In the last hours of the war, Best and Stevens and their accused accomplice, Munich bomber George Elser, were transported by bus to Dachau. But for reasons not fully known, Elser was removed from the bus and executed by SS guards at the last minute. The English agents then returned home, where they faced an uncomfortable cross-examination by British intelligence. Whether or not Best and Stevens ever conspired with Elser to kill Hitler remains a mystery. The British files on Venlo have been closed until the year 2055. 
The rivalry between the SD and the Abwehr, and Heydrich and Canaris in particular, served to send mixed signals to the Western powers. But even if an Allied connection had been made with the Abwehr, there was still little support in Germany for an armed rebellion. Remember, there was no major armed opposition in Germany. There were no partisans here. There would have been no possibility of political support for such a thing. In my opinion, the British Secret Service did the only reasonable thing possible. It listened to the German opposition, it attempted to ascertain its strengths, but it only would have come to a greater loss of German blood had the British Secret Service stepped up its support for the German opposition.